I just love Leanne's story. After missing a passing grade by just four points, she used a 240 guide, brushed up her knowledge in a month, and then passed with flying colors on her next attempt. We get so excited to help people like Leanne accomplish their goals and get in the classroom. My name is Emma, and I've helped thousands of teachers pass the Praxis exams. And today, I'm here to help you. This video is going to prepare you for the Praxis Middle School Mathematics Test. If you're a fan of test codes, the Praxis Middle Math Exam is number 5164. This video is going to cover three things. What's on the test and how to study for it, the most likely concepts that will be on the test, and we're going to look at a few practice questions. Whether you're looking to start a first, second, or even fifth career as an educator, stay tuned to learn the key concepts you need to know. Now, the middle school math exam consists of five areas called categories. Numbers and operations, algebra, functions, geometry and measurement, and statistics and probability. The first category we'll look at is numbers and operations. This one will make up about 23% of your exam. We can break this category into two sections. First, operations with real numbers. This involves adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, and using exponents and parentheses in math problems. And can you do all that with decimals, percents, and fractions? And the second is mathematical reasoning, or basically, can you think critically about math topics? I know that this feels like a lot, but we're going to go through it step by step. Let's dive into operations with real numbers. In this section, you're going to need to be able to solve using real numbers, including decimals, percentages, and fractions. And you'll have to follow standard math rules. So make sure you use the order of operations to solve for the correct answer. Trying to solve the problem without using the order of operations would leave you with the wrong answer. So it's all about knowing which step to do first. Remember PEMDAS? That whole, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally thing? Use it. You're going to need to know what order to do specific operations in so that you can solve the problem to get the correct answer. How about the other piece of numbers and operations? Mathematical reasoning. A big part of this section is being able to correctly interpret and use basic units. So for example, if you're asked for an answer in feet, but all of the measurements are in inches, can you do the conversion? Here's a good example from our study guide. Christy is ordering new carpet for her bedroom. She measured the room to be 12 feet wide and 15 feet long, but the carpet company needs a measurement in square yards. How many square yards of carpet does Christy need? We walk you through converting the measurements from feet to yards, then doing the calculation. Christy needs 20 square yards of new carpet for her bedroom. And I can tell you prefer videos. So we have videos working out lots of these problems too. Nice, we made it through the whole first category. Next, we're moving on to algebra, which will also make up about 23% of your test. You may already know what's coming here. Find X. Find X over here. Find X over there. Find X everywhere. But let's break this part down a little further. There are two sections found in this category. The first is algebraic expressions. This is where you'll have to deal with algebraic expressions, of course. But specifically, can you write them and can you simplify them? Then we take it up a few notches. The second section is specifically about linear equations, or equations that can be represented with a line on a graph. Let's look a little closer at what we need to know. Let's start with the basics, algebraic expressions. You might be given an expression like this one and need to choose an equivalent expression. That's just a fancy way of saying that you need to be able to find an expression that is equal to the one you are given. In this case, we're able to simplify the given expression. We go from three times the quantity of x plus two plus 12 all divided by three and simplify it down to x plus six. Moving on to linear relationships. Ooh, we have a great video on this in our study guide. Let's take a look. Solve for x in the equation three times the quantity of x minus four plus 10 equals 13. Start with simplification. Since x and four are not like terms, the parentheses cannot be simplified as the first step. Instead, multiply by applying the distributive property. Now we combine like terms, the negative 12 and the positive 10 to get negative two. Now isolate x. First, add two to both sides, then divide both sides by three. This leaves us with x equals five. Remember, according to the properties of equality, the two expressions remain equal to each other as long as you do the same thing to both sides. Last, check the solution in the original equation by using substitution. Make sure to use parentheses to avoid sign issues. 
then simplify. Since both sides simplify to the same value, 13, the value of x we found is correct. So helpful, right? We've got lots more great videos where that came from if you check out our study guide. Man, we're cruising. Two categories down, three to go. The functions category makes up about 17% of your exam and breaks down into two parts. What is a function and how to use functions? Starting with, what is a function? A big part of this section is, as you may have guessed, simply identifying whether or not a set of values actually is a function. A function is a special type of relation where each input has only one output. For example, here are three relations. The x values are the inputs and the y values are the outputs. Let's look at set A first. This is a function because each number on the left is connected to only one number on the right. For set B, the number two on the left is connected to both three and four on the right. So set B is not a function. Finally, in set C, each number on the left is only pointed to the number two on the right. So this is a function too. Now let's look at how to use functions. In this section, there's a lot of real-world examples. Specifically, you'll need to know the difference between linear functions and exponential functions. Here's a couple of examples to help you understand the difference. In situation A, we see a linear function because the total grows by the same amount, in this case, $20 each time. But in situation B, we see an exponential function because the total grows by an increasing amount each time. You'll need to know how to recognize the different function situations and which equation form to use in each. Now that was just the tip of the function's iceberg. Hmm, would an iceberg function be a parabola? I don't know, that's the type of thing we'll answer for you in the study guide. It'll give you the confidence you deserve to pass your test. Only two categories to go. Geometry and measurement is up next, and it makes up about 20% of your test. And as you may have guessed, we're going to split this into geometry and measurement. In the geometry section, you need to know all about shapes, lines, and angles. One of the things you're going to need to know in this geometry section is the Pythagorean theorem. Remember that? A squared plus B squared equals C squared? It's okay if you need to brush up on how to use that formula. You should check out the videos that come in our study guide. You know what? Let's just take a sneak peek now. In this diagram, A equals four units, B equals three units, and C equals five units. Geometrically, the square of A can be shown as a square with sides of length A. Likewise, the square of B can be shown as a square with sides of length B, and the square of C by a square with sides of length C. When the Pythagorean theorem is tested, the two sides are equal. By using the Pythagorean theorem, you can find the length of any side of a right triangle if the other two sides are known. Let's try an example. A right triangle has a hypotenuse of 10 centimeters and one leg of eight centimeters. What is the length of the third side? First, write the equation and fill in the known information. We were given the hypotenuse 10 and one leg eight. So we have eight squared plus B squared equals 10 squared. We will be solving for B, the missing leg. Simplify. Square the known values and combine like terms, which gives us b squared equals 36. Isolate by taking the square root of both sides, leaving us with b equals 6. So the length of the missing side is 6 centimeters. We've got a lot more helpful videos where that came from. Let's see what you can expect to see in the measurement portion of the test. A big thing here is learning to estimate measures like weight and length, and choosing the appropriate units. It helps to have some real-world equivalents to compare to, like the ones we provided for you here. So if someone asks you the height of a classroom, you'd likely measure it in meters. Millimeters, centimeters, and kilometers just wouldn't make sense, because your answer would either be really large or really small. Boom! Only one more category to go. Statistics and probability makes up the last 17% of your exam. But that's still about 11 questions, so you'll want to make sure you know what you're talking about. And just like geometry and measurement, we're not going to make this any more complicated than it has to be. Let's split this into statistics and probability. In the statistics portion, you're going to need to know how to represent data in a graph or plot. 
You might be given a data set and asked which graph or plot would best be used to represent that data. Here's a list of common graphs and plots along with the type of data they best represent. If you're working with categorical data, choose a bar graph or pie chart. If you're working with quantitative data, you've got some more options. Line graphs track changes over time, dot plots and stem and leaf plots are best with small data sets, and box plots and histograms are better with large data sets. The data I'm seeing here is that you might be feeling overwhelmed by all these graph choices. Need a little help brushing up? Don't worry, we've got you. The 240 Study Guide has in-depth study material on these and so much more. We're on to the last concept for today, probability. A lot of this boils down to simple calculations of how likely it is that a given event is going to happen. And this really means taking the number of successful outcomes possible divided by the total number of outcomes possible. And remember to consider if the event is independent or dependent. And that's it. We've talked through all the categories you'll come up against in this exam. But again, to really have the confidence you deserve, go subscribe to a 240 study guide. You can get the study guide for the Praxis Middle School Math exam. Now that we've gone over some of the big concepts in our two areas, let's look at some practice questions to show you how those concepts can appear on the test. If you want a lot of practice questions, you can click the free practice test below. At the end, you get a score report on how well you did on the test and then you can subscribe to 240 and get all the practice questions you need to be 100% confident for your test. Did I mention the 240 study guide has a money back guarantee that you'll pass? Now for questions. Remember for numbers and operations, I told you that you'll need to remember the order of operations? Let's go there first. Simplify the expression, 82 minus 100 divided by four plus six times 12. As we start to run through PEMDAS, there are no parentheses or exponents in this expression, so we can skip those steps. Then we move on to multiplication and division from left to right. Finally, we can simplify the remaining addition and subtraction from left to right, meaning this is our best answer. One question down, how about an algebra question? If 1 fifth x plus three equals six, what is the value of x? To isolate x, we subtract both sides by three, then divide by 1 fifth. But wait, you can't divide by a fraction. So instead, you multiply by the reciprocal, five. The answer is B, 15. Next up is functions. Which of the following relations represent a function? Remember, in order for a number set to be a function, there can only be one output for every input. Or in other words, the X value can't repeat. So looking at choice A, there are two zeros in the X column, so it is not a function. In the next choice, each plotted point has a different x value, so it is a function. Then we move on and see that the input of negative one is connected to both two and seven. This means it is not a function. Finally, choice D has no repeating x values, so it is a function. So choices A and C are not functions, but choices B and D are functions. Geometry is up next. A quilter is preparing to make a quilt for a baby's crib that is 30 inches by 50 inches. The design of the quilt calls for a diagonal stripe of ribbon from one corner of the quilt to another corner, as shown in the image above. What is the approximate length of that diagonal stripe of ribbon in the finished quilt? While I know this looks like a rectangle, once we add that ribbon down the center, we're really dealing with two triangles here. We're given the two sides of our triangles and asked to find the hypotenuse. We can use the Pythagorean theorem to get the answer of D. 58 inches. Finally, statistics and probability. The circle graph shows the results of a survey of 150 students. How many students chose basketball as their favorite sport? This problem gives us survey data, a pie chart, and asks how many students chose basketball as their favorite sport. I see an 8% in the wedge for basketball, so I'm going to pick that choice. Ah, oh, rats, that seemed too easy. Let's take a step back and try again. Since 150 students were asked, the percentage doesn't equal the number of students. Instead, we need to multiply the percentage by the total, so 8% times 150. For the first 100 students, that 8% is the same as eight students. But for the remaining 50, it'd be half, so another four students, giving us 12 total. Now, that's just a small sliver of practice questions to give you an idea about how those concepts are assessed on the test. Congratulations on finishing the video. If you found it helpful, give it a like. 
there's still plenty more to learn. Did you know that thousands of teachers have used 240 to pass their certification exams? If you really want to make sure you're prepared for the Praxis Middle School Math, take the next step and subscribe to the 240 Study Guide. It has hours of videos so you can watch and or listen while doing chores. It's test aligned so you know precisely what you need to study. And it has hundreds of practice questions so you can be sure you're ready. And it has the money back guarantee. So click the link below right now to get started.